Grace and peace. Welcome to Sabbath School Study Group, where we are in part two of a five part series on Paul's first missionary journey. And we're taking a second look at the work in Pisidian Antioch to look at another reality in those who did not receive the gospel, but unfortunately in those who rejected it. But before we go there, let's look at Acts 13, verse 38 to 39. This is our prayer and focus verse. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. We believe this, Lord, and claim this now in study in Jesus' name. Amen. When we see Paul in this journey where he made several stops along the way, and we're skipping ahead to his stop in the city of Pisidian Antioch, not the Antioch from which he left, but this is a stop in the circuit or the circle of his first journey. And looking at the second part of this city's life or story, we realize that Paul had to turn to the Gentiles because the Jews turned from Jesus. In Acts chapter 13, verse 42, we pick up the story. When the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, after Paul had shared the gospel, the Gentiles besought that these words, this glad tidings might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And so now here we see the gospel working in the hearts, working in the hearts of those who have been expecting a Messiah and working in the hearts of those who are just coming to know the reality of a Messiah. Now, skipping forward to verse 44, on the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. So in last Sabbath, they got a sample and the sample was so good. They were ready for the entree. So on the next Sabbath, which Paul and Barnabas continued to keep, not because they were cultural Jews, but because they were biblical Christians, they continued to keep the commandments of God, even the fourth commandment to remember the seventh day Sabbath. And they gathered together to worship, but they weren't alone because in verse 45, when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. This is the atmosphere, uh, the arena where the gospel is preached and it's being rejected by those who are rejecting Jesus. And this is why we see the transition happening in Paul's ministry where his emphasis and his burden is to save his brothers. In fact, he continues to have this burden throughout his life. And it's not that Paul stops preaching to Jews in this situation and what happens in Antioch. But what does happen is that the primacy or the primary focus of his ministry is to those outside of Israel. It is to those Gentiles. And so now we see him turning as the Lord turns because folks are turning from him. The Lord desires and loves everyone, but he cannot get to someone who refuses to be gotten to. That's free will. That's the term of agreement in the great controversy that in this battle between good and evil, we all are free to choose our sides. So it's not just Paul turning from the Jews, but more significantly, it's the Jews turning from Jesus. Because of this, we have to recognize that our rejection of light is our own choice. In fact, look at verse 30, 46 of Acts 13. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you because they were told for generations to expect salvation, to expect Messiah. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So who is turning from who? Paul is turning to the Jews. In effect, the Lord is turning to the Jews, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy. 
This is not even God judging them. They are judging themselves by virtue of their choice. They are unplugging themselves from the light source. Not much different than what happened in Exodus 32. In Exodus 32, in verse 7, when Moses and Joshua are on the mountain and Moses is receiving the will and, and the law of God, the Lord says to Moses, Go, get thee down. For thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I have commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and they have worshiped it and they have sacrificed thereunto. And they have said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. The onus of the activity of the fall of Israel in Acts 32 is no different than the onus of activity or the burden of rejecting the grace in Acts 13. We make our own choice. That's why in Ezekiel 18, verse 30, he says, therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. So the inference of this call in Ezekiel 13 is that Israel has turned to the transgressions. And now our responsibility as believers and our opportunity as sinners is to turn back to God. So, so many people, they cry out and they say, Lord, why have you left me? God, why have you abandoned me? And I have learned that when I am off track, the first feet I need to look at are not for his, but at mine. And say, Lord, where did I leave you? Lord, where did I drop you? And the shepherd lets me know that I took an exit. The road didn't dead end. I took an exit that was a dead end. And Jesus, the shepherd, leads me back if we're willing to turn. Turning back to him, the good news is, is that for those of us who are, are praying for and, and looking for those who've turned from him, a lot of times you can be rejected and you can be ridiculed and persecuted in a way that you doubt what the Lord has asked you to do. And the encouragement that we get in Paul's story here is that the way to cope with godly rejection and your call for those to return is to remember your godly calling. The way to cope with godly rejection is to remember your godly calling. Notice I say godly rejection. Too often people mistake their own stubbornness and selfishness and its results as a persecution for doing what God's asked them to do. No, no. Talking about godly rejection. When you've done what the Lord has asked you to do with a pure heart. Remember Acts 13 verse 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. This was the commission and the authority that Paul had. I've commanded you and I've set you to be a light so that you will be salvation unto the ends of the earth. Paul knew what he was called to do. And because his calling was the basis of his identity, by the time you get to verse 51, we don't see him pouting. We don't see them gnashing and weeping. We don't see them lamenting and doubting if they should have done this in the first place. No, they shook off the dust off of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. In other words, they moved on. They were able to take the rejection and go knock on the next door, respecting their choice, not rejoicing that they rejected them, but respecting their choice enough to hurry on. Because there's someone else who needs the chance to choose. That's why they did this in verse 52 with joy. The disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost post rejection. Because you can shake it off. You can shake the dust off of your feet when you know you've got somewhere else to go. Because you're doing what the Lord has called you to do. Just because one student rejects you doesn't mean that the class is not going to accept you. Just because one door closes does not mean that a whole nother complex, a whole nother building won't say yes. We've got to keep moving, keep walking, walking in what? Walking in your calling that the Lord has commanded you and called you to be a light to the Gentiles at work, at school, at home, in your neighborhood, on the block, wherever you are, that's where the light should be. Jesus saved you to save others and we save them by loving them. Let's remember, be it known unto you, therefore, brethren, men and brethren, that through this man, 
is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Everyone has their choice and all of us simply have to choose to be chosen. If you were blessed by what you just saw and heard, praise Jesus. We're glad, in fact, so glad that we want to invite you to visit our website, changeministry.org, where you will find this and so much more to encourage your walk with Christ. If you feel impressed, we'd also appreciate a donation that would support our ministry. We are trying to create a fund that would allow us to travel to any church, any school, anywhere, totally free of charge. And so we appreciate your support, not just of this ministry, but the work of change.